Hello and welcome to the Refugee Welcome Collective Lunch and Learn series. In these sessions, we aim to bring interesting and timely information to you, supporters of refugees. Whether you are a volunteer, community sponsor, resettlement agency staff, a local advocate, or just someone who is interested in learning more, we hope you enjoy today's session, Supporting Ongoing Integration, Understanding the Sponsor's Role. Um, we here at Refugee Welcome Collective collaborate with partners to provide in-depth training programs, weekly learning sessions, resources, and on-demand technical assistance for sponsors, practitioners at resettlement agencies, refugees paired with sponsors, community and institutional partners, and others to support quality community sponsorship programs across the United States. Next slide. As a reminder for everyone joining um, the Lunch and Learn today, there is a control panel in the upper right hand corner of your screen that will allow you to submit questions through the questions box. There will be ample time at the end of the webinar for Q&A. Everyone on today's webinar is automatically muted. However, if you have any tech issues, please raise your hand through the control panel or submit a question in the questions box so we can assist you. Additionally, a recording will be sent to all of the attendees and registrants for today's webinar. This brings us to our presenter for today. Um, our presenter is Thomas Huddleston. Thomas is the co-sponsorship manager at the Ethi Ethiopian Community Development Council's Multicultural Community Center of Southern Vermont. And today he shares with us expertise he has uh, previously gained working in refugee integration with um, the European Union, um, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, civil society, and philanthropy. Uh, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. Thank you so much to the Refugee Welcome Collective. Uh, it's great to be able to connect all of the experiences that we have piloting sponsorship at the local level here in the US and making plans uh, for the future. So I was interested to share with all of you what could be some of the next steps that your groups would be preparing for as you think about a longer term integration. I know that some of our sponsorship programs uh, started with the Afghan placement uh, program. And so some of your groups might be preparing for what would be the next steps, what would be their kind of stepping down and um, stepping up of different refugees responsibilities that they themselves are gonna be taking on. And so you might be asking, well, what is our role as sponsors in that process? Um, and what can we reasonably expect will be the challenge uh, for resettled refugees and how can we contribute? So what I propose to do um, over this Lunch and Learn is help break down some of these definitions, right? So what exactly is the resettlement phase of sponsorship and what are sponsors' roles there that are useful for refugees longer term? But then using data that we have about the longer term integration process of refugees in the United States, I want to remind you that that resettlement phase is not the same as integration and that families will face longer term transitions uh, in the United States. I then want to come back to the role that sponsors have in that first phase of resettlement so that you can see what steps you take in those first few months that really are facilitators, getting refugees on that right path for the second phase of integration. And then I wanna give you some working definitions. What is integration longer term? What are sponsors roles in this second phase of integration? Um, and beyond what the, your roles are, how can you pursue those roles? How can you build pathways, build relationships and build trust for refugees, which are the three things so critical um, for their long-term success? And what might be some indicators that you can follow in those months um, that will tell you that you have done a successful role in preparing refugees for this second long-term phase of integration. And I'll end with some three practical examples, two of which come from our work in Southern Vermont, where we as ECDC's Multicultural Community Center have been able to guarantee co-sponsorship and support teams for the majority of our 2022 arrivals. So what is resettlement? Um, just a reminder from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, resettlement is the only durable solution that involves 
being able to transfer a refugee legally from one state to another. And that second state provides effective reception, such as uh, legal status, cultural orientation, language training, access to employment, access to education. Well, you might recognize some of those areas because these are core responsibilities that sponsors take on in the first phase of integration. Um, more or less the first 90 days uh, after arrival, which kind of corresponds to that first refugee and placement program or the Afghan placement program with intensive uh, case management from uh, agencies that you might know if you're in a co-sponsorship system. And some of the roles that, that you have to guarantee successful resettlement is, uh, for example, enrolling newcomers in their benefits and their health care, making sure that they attend cultural orientation classes and learn about community activities, get them enrolled in um, ESL, get them enrolled in employment services, and hopefully uh, secure them their first US job within those 90 days, and get their kids enrolled in school while seeing if their previous experience from abroad can be somehow recognized, for example, through a diploma recognition. So that's a good first step, but as I said, resettlement is a uh, short-term uh, focus on you know, initial reception, getting people set up in a country, but integration is a much longer-term process. So I'm giving you some data uh, from the United States and comparing it to Canada, which has a longer established sponsorship system. So we can see you know, how sponsorship has worked out in Canada and, and maybe ask, will sponsorship in the US give us some similar results? Um, so what you see here is that uh, two years after arriving um, in the United States or Canada, you know, around half of refugee adults uh, have some type of job. That's a lower employment rate than for uh, native born in, that, in those countries. And it's after around 10 years or more that um, an overwhelming majority, around uh, two thirds or three quarters, end up in a job. Um, and actually, it seems like working with sponsors helps privately sponsored refugees to more quickly find a job. Um, look at the red lines here, which show you whether privately sponsored men or women have jobs um, compared to government assisted refugees, so those who don't have a sponsor, or to economic migrants, those who come with a work visa and a work sponsor. And you'll see that actually uh, refugees that have sponsors, both men and women, um, are some of the most likely to have jobs when they arrive. It actually kind of dips after those one, two, three years. So maybe after the sponsor relationship uh, is over. Um, but uh, longer term, it's pre still pretty stable. So yes, that, those steps that you take in the first three months, uh, helping refugees to secure a job as a sponsor uh, is a good long-term payment and certainly guarantees a better outcomes than for other refugees. But a job is just a job. It's not necessarily the full path to inclusion in society. And so here's some data just from the United States, looking at how cohorts of refugees uh, have done in 2010 and also a bit earlier. And um, what you see is that um, for those who've just arrived in the past five years, uh, their incomes are much lower than your average American. Um, based on data from around 2010, their income is only around 42% that of the average American. And as you can see, that does go up over time after five to 10 years, or generally, let's say, around 10 to 20 years. So what you can use as a benchmark is that around you know, 10 to 20 years, a, a refugee family should be on par with you know an average american with the same kind of um background as they have but that's, oh, that's quite a, that's quite a long, that's quite a long wait and we see from data from canada that while sponsored refugees are more likely to get into jobs what you can see is that the jobs that they get into are often uh as low income and similar as to other uh, government-sponsored refugees, right? So 
you get into a job, but it's still going to be a long haul before you get a decent income. And so as a result, coming back to some data from the United States, um, again, it takes up to 10, if not uh, 20 years for um, refugees to get out of being stuck in a, a low income household. So after 20 to 30 years, about one third of refugee households are still in a low income household. And that's similar to Americans, right? About one third of US born Americans are also in a low income household, right? So that's still gonna be a, a challenge for around a third of refugees that they are struggling with the challenges that low income workers have in the United States. And English knowledge is also going to be a long term challenge. So this is looking at uh, over time, whether refugees are still qualified as limited English proficient speakers, meaning that they still have challenges to read, speak, or understand English, and they might potentially need uh, interpretation services. So even after you know, 10 years in the United States, um, around 60% of refugees will still be needing English uh, assistance. And that's, that's also true, as you see, for many other uh, immigrants to the United States. So uh, learning English is also a, a long-term process. So what can you do in that first phase of resettlement, like in those first 90 days, to try and ensure that you have set um, your refugee family up well to start on this second phase of integration, which is that longer term path. Well, making sure that your family has their identity documents all set up, that they are in stable housing so they don't have to move so that they can start pursuing the local opportunities, that you have identified any health barriers that they have to make sure that those get addressed, that they have completed cultural orientation and that first phase of ESL so that they really have the survival English and basic knowledge of the opportunities in your area. That they have secured reliable transportation, public transportation, or maybe even on their path to get their driver's license. So that again, they can uh, go after the opportunities that you might identify. That they have good contacts with you, that they trust you, but that they also know their neighbors and they also have some potential friends um, in the area who they can start to build relationships with that they know who some of the local employers and activities are in their area professional background or uh, areas of interest, that they have that first job, they have that resume, and that they know who they're going to be working with after those first 90 days, right? So they, they know what they can be um, receiving as services from their resettlement agency and also from those mainstream service providers because they are going to need them after those 90 days, right? It's not just those first services that they need. So I wanted to give you some perspective on what this kind of second phase uh, looks like, uh, the second phase of integration. And the definitions of integration vary a bit country by country, institution by institution, but they're, but they're pretty similar. So here I first give you the definition from, again, the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees, that integration is a complex and gradual process with legal, economic, social, and cultural dimensions, that it imposes considerable demands, both for the individual and for the receiving society. Now, the, um, uh, the Obama administration gave us a more um, nuanced definition of integration in its 2015 Federal Strategic Action Plan on Immigrant and Refugee Integration. So if you want a better perspective in the US, I really recommend looking into that document. And they try and define some of those dimensions of integration. So for example, acquiring US citizenship is often a culmination point uh, in that process. Being able to fully participate in your local area and feel a, a sense of belonging to the US, to your local area. Being able to have that English proficiency that you need in your life, but also be able to um, continue to improve your knowledge of your native language and use that and teach that to your children. Being able to express yourself and your culture um, and enrich the, the culture of your local area. Having a, a clear idea of what your 
longer term career could look like in the United States and what are the different pathways that you could take or what new careers you could explore and what are some of the steps that you could take to get some of that economic self-sufficiency so that you can make more things happen in your life and more clarity on what are those higher education or training pathways that that you could get in order to improve your career so so these are some of the aspects of that second phase of integration well what can you do as sponsors um, in the end this second phase of integration as you saw uh, takes years and it varies a lot based on people's uh, social background, economic background, language knowledge, um, family contacts. And I have to say that this is really the hardest phase and hardest transition, not just for refugees, but for immigrants that I've worked with around the world, right? That first phase where everybody has the same needs and you get everyone set up um, is uh, pretty straightforward as a process, even if it still has its struggles. But making sure that refugees and immigrants start that second phase, that they get on those pathways and start getting into those longer term process, that's really the main challenge. And that's your major added value as sponsors is to make sure that, um, that refugees get connected to those different pathways and start trusting and working with those partners in that pathway. So this is not your responsibility to <laughs> to complete the second phase of integration, right? This is something that refugees themselves are leading on. They're gonna be making decisions about their lives, they're gonna be making changes in how they see their life in the United States. And it's not for you to tell them what the future is going to look like, but it is your role in those remaining, say, six uh, or nine months of uh, sponsorship to make sure that they get that information and connection uh, in your local area. So depending on the responsibilities that you've signed up for as sponsorship, you know, here are some of the steps that I know from our ECDC model that you might be involved in uh, to try and get refugees on the right path in those different dimensions. So the path to citizenship is a long one, but you might be offering uh, referrals or helping refugees know what are their plans for the additional legal services that they might need for their legal status. Um, you might be connecting them to, to new friends, um, bringing their families together, helping them learn their neighborhood, helping them learn the opportunities in the local area that match their interest. This will help them find the paths that longer term will lead to greater participation and belonging. Um, you will have signed them up for ESL, but you want to make sure that they have um, a pathway through ESL, right? So that they know what the different ESL options are for them as they get higher and higher in their proficiency, as they start maybe needing more writing support, as um, they need our uh, classes at different hours, as their family and work responsibilities shift. You might be pairing them with conversation partners who are gonna be continuing to offer them informal English learning outside of the classroom. And you might be finding them way, helping them find ways to express themselves, um, connect with other uh, refugee cultural groups and organizations in your area. You can contribute to helping them find their career pathways by, again, knowing who the local employers are in their area of work, connecting them to a professional mentor from the same career path that they had so that they can continue to get advice and just helping them know you know, okay, well, based on the career that you had or that you're interested in in the US, what are some of the steps that you could be taking to pursue your career plan and also to start saving up the money that you might need for those investments in your career that you're going to need? And part of that might involve pursuing retraining. And there you can help them identify what those retraining options are in your local area. Those might be the formal ones that everyone thinks about, like uh, higher education. Uh, university. It could be informal opportunities, right? Uh, there are different ways of developing your skills other than through uh, what you do at your job. It could be through volunteering that you do or support that you offer to others. And it could also be on the job training opportunities that you have at a job that you're not excited about, but where they will allow you to take on additional responsibilities that give you those new skills. Now, these are 
what you can do as as tasks um, as sponsors to help people get on that second phase but what i really want you to think about is that it's it's less about what you will do as sponsors and more about how you are going to help your family find other sponsors and support in your community because i want to kind of rethink this definition of sponsorship i think that often people think oh well me being a sponsor means that i am the one responsible for my family i have sponsored my family which makes you think well I, again oh i'm going to be responsible for for them and their integration longer term but actually sponsorship is a term that's really common in immigration under immigration law, nearly all immigrants are required to have some sort of legal sponsor if you want to come legally to the country. So for example, um, if you want to come and work in the United States, you need an employer who's going to sponsor you for a work visa. If you want to come study in the United States as an international student, you need a university that is willing to uh, sponsor you. And if you're a US citizen or immigrant and you want your spouse or your children to come with you, you have to be uh, their sponsor for family reunification. And all of those roles actually um, set different types of immigrants up on different uh, pathways to their settlement and integration, right? If you're sponsored by your employer, you're gonna get new colleagues, you're gonna get a work supervisor, you're gonna get a work environment, you're going to uh, get an income, you're going to be able to uh, plan out your career in the United States. If you uh, go to a university as an international student, you're gonna get your fellow students, your professors, they'll give you references, they'll build your networks, you'll get a degree. And if you're sponsoring your family for family unification, you're gonna be deciding for your family where they live, you're gonna help them find a job, you're gonna introduce them to friends, to schools, and so on, right? So um, sponsorship is often the things that refugees have traditionally lacked in immigration systems, right? Refugees don't get to apply to come to our country and they often don't have um, connections here. They don't have those networks that work migrants, international students, and family migrants have. So for resettled refugees, you know, having a US tie in the community or having a sponsor can allow them to find those other connections in the community. So what we can do as sponsors is really accompany newcomers so that in that first year here, they can make some of their own decisions about what their future life is gonna look like in the United States, who they're gonna be working with. Um, and they're gonna find their own pathways and their own sponsors that they're gonna be working with in this second phase of integration. So who might your uh, family's second sponsors be? Um, what might be the pathways that are out there? Um, it's really important that you as a sponsor decenter yourself and, and think a little bit more about who is that social support network out there for your family in your local area. Because your family's relationship with these people may be much more important for their success longer term than is your relationship with them as a sponsor. And I know that might be kind of hard to imagine, but you've got to Think about your, you've stepped in to work with this family, but you don't necessarily have the same uh, professional social background as them. Um, you might like each other, but you might not be the best of friends. Um, you, it might feel like you have a family relationship, but you're not really family, right? And so um, in order for the second phase of integration to work, refugees need to feel like they have found those other people in the community who uh, share um, more in common with them and will be willing to work with them longer term. So here are some examples of um, who might be your family's social support network. Offering yeah, this, them is a bit, this is a bit of a um, perspective um, twist for us uh, <laughs> here, Thomas, but I think we're with you. I think we're with you. Okay, so things might be like, if they've got extended family, um, if they have a U.S. tie. Uh, important that they have friends, right? Both U.S. friends um, and also refugee friends are almost more important than having U.S. friends in terms of feeling settled. Um, having good relationships with your work colleagues, with your work supervisor, with a professional mentor. 
um, recognizing that your teacher is actually someone who will offer you a lot of opportunities in the future. So your ESL teacher, the school teacher for your kids, your university or your adult ed teacher, um, the religious leader of the um, religious institution frequented by your family, other refugee community leaders, your uh, refugee family's doctor, their roommate, their neighbors, right? So if you map this for your family, not every family is gonna have uh, all of these people in their life and it's gonna change over time, but think about each of these people and how you as a sponsor can either increase the number of people like this in your family's life or how you can deepen your family's relationship and your family's trust with these people. Um, and if this is working out, if you deepen those relationships, here are some of the things that, you know, after those six months, nine months, you should be seeing or aiming to see, because this is telling you that your family has secured some of those pathways that they're gonna continue in their second phase of integration, even when you have um, no longer a, a sponsorship relationship with them, right? So they will be in ongoing ESL that, is adapted to their work and family obligations. You, you really want to avoid that um, refugees are not in employment, education, or training. Uh, if someone is not in employment, education, or training, uh, then they are missing out on those opportunities to build their skills, right? So um, making sure that they're continuing in ESL and in training, that they know what the next steps could be for them in their study or career plans. Um, having their family reunited, even ongoing migration, moving out of your area, but moving to be reunited with close family uh, could be more successful because again, their family might be a more sustainable long-term sponsor, opening up so many opportunities for them in the future. Uh, having many friends, regularly attending uh, religious community or local activities of interest, uh, when refugees are volunteering, helping, and celebrating with others, that's also a good sign that they have a, they feel like they have a social support network that they can trust. And just watch out over this phase for any of the transitions that your family might have, changes in work, changes in family, changes in housing, because this can really uh, get refugees off that second phase of integration. So just to, to wrap up, I wanted to give you three practical examples. Um, two from uh, our work at the Multicultural Community Center in Vermont, and one from when I did uh, sponsorship myself in Belgium with the Humanitarian Corridor Program. We supported a Syrian uh, refugee family that came and, you know, we found them their apartment and we got them set up with their benefits and got them set up with doctors. But in the end, what was most important is that we were able to reunite them with their son who was just a few hours away and with uh, their new daughter-in-law uh, who actually was a local and um, could speak a language and connect them if everything we were important but they we realized they weren't really calling us they were calling the arabic speaking social worker from the local organization that we had connected them with and so it was important for them to realize that they could always call her when they had challenges um, they continued uh, with their French teachers and so again making sure that they developed trust and they could communicate regularly with um, with her we were able to get them in a building where they had great neighbors um, they went to a church that was also an Arabic speaking church um, all of that was important so that in the end they had friendships they found opportunities they were connected and you know this family um, had to go through a really difficult bout with cancer. And actually one of the, um, the husband in the family ended up passing away. And we thought that again, we were gonna be needed to rush in and, and support and make sure that they got the medical care they needed, but they had been connected with an Arabic speaking doctor and with the priest from their local church. So they were able to have that support network that they needed through that huge uh, challenge in their life. This is an example from one of our co-sponsorship groups in Southern Vermont, Bennington County Open Arms. They're supporting a, a young woman uh, and her husband and two kids. Uh, she was a midwife back in Afghanistan. Um, they have been able to ensure that she's got a really good relationship with her neighbors, another Afghan family with kids the same age, and their landlord who lives next door. So now whenever there are challenges or questions, they go directly to each other. 
they've connected the family with uh, daycare and they've developed a good relationship with the Head Start daycare teacher for their kids. Um, the woman continues to go to uh, ESL and has a good relationship with her ESL teacher. And now they're connecting her with the local community college that's offering an additional writing program that she needs. And they're uh, uh, looking into a online LNA program that she'll be able to pursue. And now we're trying to reunite her with her sister and their family, right? So all of this is providing her with that support network that she's going to need to longer term requalify as an LNA uh, in Vermont. And I wanted to end with one family um, which is preliterate, which is going to have longer term struggles, is uh, enrolled in our preferred communities program. So they're going to be working with intensive case management long term. And there as well, uh, we're trying to build up positive relationships uh, for that family with their Afghan neighbor and with new roommates who we've been able to bring in and who might be able to help the family um, be more autonomous in, in managing the, um, the house itself. We're trying to encourage a positive relationship with the work supervisor so that the, the husband and the family can take on more responsibilities at work and get some of those more informal uh, skills and on-the-job training. We are making sure that they stay connected to their ESL teachers um, through ongoing uh, classes and that they're developing good relationships with their kids' uh, teachers at school. We um, are, have a community center at MCC and they have been developing stronger relationships with our manager there and with our sewing team and teachers that give uh, the mother in that family a, a community of Afghan women uh, that she can go to for various uh, needs and the family uh, loves to garden, would like to become farmers at some point. So we've connected them with a free garden plot and with local farmers uh, donating for slaughter, as well as connecting them with the case manager that they are gonna be working with and that they can be building up trust with. So these are just a few practical ways that I tried to help our sponsor teams realize that they have um, connected their families or are connecting their families with those integration pathways and those kind of second sponsors that longer term are going to help these refugee families make the choices that they want to make about their future in the United States. Thank you so much. I'm really excited for the conversation. Yeah, thank you, um, Thomas. And I do, I, I think I find it helpful, this, um, you know, kind of like framework and feel free to uh, correct me that, that you are, you know, proposing kind of like, oh, how do you connect to them to their their second phase sponsors or what have you, that you're not gonna be there, correct, for like the whole second phase, um, but you're just connecting them for that, uh, that second phase. Um, we are now going to um, open it up to questions and conversation. Um, anything submitted during today's presentation and you can still submit questions through the questions pane um, in, your, uh, in your control panel there. Let's see. Um, one question I have for you, um, Thomas, not not to start off with a challenge, but but we know we we um, sponsors and volunteers, we always like a challenge. <laughs> um, but but what um, you know, you mentioned something such as connecting um, folks with ESL pathways, um, and then you also mentioned um, career pathways. Um, what what advice would you have if um, you know for a sponsor if if the family that they're working with isn't interested in those connections that they're trying to make. Yeah, so I think the, the, the first point is to make sure that they see the longer term steps. So you'll start off here, um, when you advance, you'll be able to go to here, when you work, you'll be able to go to there. So, and, and putting that information down in a way that they can understand is useful, right? So that when they do become interested, they can go back to that information. So that's already a very uh, useful step, um, planning already for the future. And um, I would also say to you have to acknowledge that people move ahead at, at different phases. They make choices at different phases. Maybe they're not ready to, to start these classes because they're um, focused on other priorities or they're nervous, they're intimidated, right? Um, it also might be that they're going through a different phase in their life. Maybe they've just uh, given birth to a, a small kid, right? So it, it's good to acknowledge that um, as a sponsor that 
people are going to move ahead at their own rhythm and, and your role is again to make sure they have all that information that they need so that they can make that choice that they understand what the benefits are and that you're not going to force them to do it right because often people really push back when they feel like integration is forced and that will kind of change the way that they see the opportunity that you're providing to them and you can be checking in with them in the future and you might find that they're uh, attitudes have changed after a few months. We certainly have have seen that in Vermont, that at, as, as people move ahead in life, they kind of come back to some of those opportunities that you presented them earlier. Yeah, um, yeah, but you're giving them the, uh, the information and the opportunities. Um, the next question, um, what do you do about, um, you mentioned this in some of your um, data information, what do you do about the small income um, if that is still all they can earn in a year here? So um, that is basically trying to help people prepare for financial um, literacy. So I would recommend that if your resettlement agency, um, well, your resettlement agency should have a program on financial uh, literacy, so you can reach out to them. If you don't have a resettlement agency in your area and you're really working for private sponsorship, I really strongly recommend that you reach out to the financial literacy organizations in your area. Um, there are many organizations that help um, low-income Americans who are struggling to make ends meet and it's really important that one of the roles that you have as a sponsor is to help um, families understand the economic realities of, of life in the United States and um, take that seriously to, to try and take some of those uh, steps. Um, connecting to those organizations might also help you realize that there might be other financial support services uh, available for a family struggling in that particular situation. But uh, your family is going to have to make those, those adjustments and your role is not to be the long-term uh, financial patron uh, of your family. Yeah, you mentioned those, those mainstream um, services. Um, let's see, another question. How can sponsors and resettlement staff like yourself um, be most helpful to each other in this? Um, this this person is um, like thinking of how to make this um, nice and smooth. <laughs> how, how I'm sure it's all nice and smooth um, there at ECDC in Vermont. How do you do that, Thomas? Ha. Huh. Um, well, this is a key. There are key moments of transition. So if you are working with a resettlement agency. Um, there's a key transition that happens after those first three months um, where the first phase of the resettlement service is over, sometimes called the RNP or the APA program before for the Afghans. And as part of that um, uh, transition, a case manager will be um, making some referrals to the family, right? So to help them understand based on the needs that they have, um, at that three month mark, um, here are some of the support services that exist in your local community, uh, mainstream service providers who can be working with, and also here are the services that we as a resettlement agency can be offering uh, longer term. The Preferred Communities Program is one that I, that I mentioned. Um, resettlement agencies sometimes also have different types of, of uh, service navigators that help in different areas, right? So it's good that um, you get that information as well so that you uh, know who are those um, mainstream service providers and uh, local resettlement agency services that your family will be able to, to turn to because that information will be really useful for you to know um, if the family maybe uh, in a while later expresses an interest in working in that area and you realize, well, actually they've been referred to those people that they can work with. And I just need to make sure that they understand that they now have to take the step to reach out and I can accompany them to make sure that they take those first steps. So um, I would say that's really the best way to work together is to when uh, your family has a, a need, um, of course, check with the agency and see if they had already given a referral or if they can uh, recommend any other uh, partners in the, in the local area. Um, and just one piece of advice I'd give there is, you know, integration does not happen because of one organization. Right. So integration happens because we create welcoming communities where all of the service providers in our areas realize that it's their responsibility to also be supporting refugees and they actually open up. Right. So resettlement agencies, I often make this joke. I say we're not 
we're not realtors, we can't find you a job, we're not insurance companies, we can't run your health care healthcare services. Um, but there are organizations in the area that do that and do that for low income people and they also have committed to work with refugees so make sure that those organizations that can get you a job that can get you health care support that can get you um uh, career uh, support are also doing their part to make integration happen yeah no that's a, um, a good point um another question and this is a little bit more of a general um co-sponsorship question from your experience, um, Thomas, but also I can see how it connects um, to, to long-term integration. Um, this uh, person is asking is, um, do you find the level of commitment is a barrier for sponsors um, getting involved? For example, you know, like financial commitments, time commitments. Um, yeah, do you see that as a barrier? Or what do you tell sponsors that might think um you know like that 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 that, that this commitment is is too much for them well what i've observed our so our co-sponsorship model at ecdc um, involves having at least seven volunteers involved in six key areas of life uh, uh, housing transportation health uh, education cultural uh, orientation and so uh, and employment and finance and um, by nature of the of those tasks it's pretty intense in the first month and then you know also really in the first three months but then um a lot of those tasks uh get completed within those first three months so a lot of what uh, co-sponsors do really relates to that resettlement phase meaning getting people set up making sure that they are well received and welcomed and the the challenges after those three months really the second phase of integration that i talked about usually involve um, helping the family get connected to those uh, mainstream service providers, mainstream services, um, struggle, learn some of the things they're struggling with, some of those self-sufficiency tasks that they're struggling with, the thing that takes a little bit more time. So uh, what I try to do with co-sponsors is make sure they realize, you know, look at everything that you've achieved in that first month, in those first three months, and now see that your tasks and your work can be much more focused um, with uh, perhaps fewer number of hours or fewer volunteers if your team is a bit shrinking um, that might be normal because you don't need to work anymore with your family on say health and housing they're all set now their challenge is really esl support and um getting uh that uh, job right so try and keep uh, your group focused on where there are those still uh, struggles for self-sufficiency and again help them realize that once they have connected their family with those that second set of sponsors and those second pathways it's actually normal that you would be kind of stepping back in from that sponsorship role and you would be making sure that families understand those people that i mentioned right your teacher your boss um, your neighbor you need to keep on working with those people. And that might also be with the resettlement agency, right? These are the people that are there in your life. And I'm happy to be in your life as a friend, but really those are the people that are offering you the opportunity. So continue to, to work with them. Yeah, I liked, um, man, I was just impressed with the adjectives you automatically attach to a lot of um, a lot of the responsibilities of you know volunteers. You were saying like reliable transportation, survival English, um, you know, and it kind of um, reminded me as to what you were saying, you know, it's like, I'm not calling any sponsors unreliable, <laughs> um, you know, but it's like, oh, the bus is going to be reliable for like years to come, you know, um, yeah, and, um, and like English, like you were saying, is evolving for years to come. Um, and so I just kind of liked those um, points that you were making, you know, too, as far as kind of like the difference in those resources that you're, um, you're connecting them to. Um, another question, and I'll be interested to see what kind of perspective um you might share with this um you know sponsor or staff member um they were asking um how do you keep the volunteers or sponsors motivated for families that need more help in the second phase of integration so so the families that need a lot of help in that second phase of integration how do you keep volunteers and sponsors motivated um, to help them well, I would say that we in Vermont don't have a problem with motivation. We have so many engaged volunteers who are super motivated themselves. But um, what I will take from that question is that, um, again, the, the first phase 
it's pretty standard. Everybody needs those steps um, to get set up in a, in a new country. But um, after that first phase, there, there are two challenging aspects, right? So one is that um, some people might struggle to complete some of those key steps in the first uh, three months and might need longer term support to do some basic things like um, manage their appointments, um, be able to get uh, transportation, be able to handle their bills, um, be able to um, get get to work, right? Um, get, get their kids to uh, school. So yes, you might have uh, longer term challenges for support. And for there, again, I try to make sure that uh, volunteers at that point are focusing their efforts on the things that are most challenging and most essential. Because yes, you could try and do everything in all areas, but we all know that if someone is able to do that key step, say maybe getting the driver's license and getting the car that they have the money for, that will solve a lot of other problems down the line. So that's one way we try and focus. The other is that we try to help them realize that they really do need to be working with our longer term uh, uh, services as a resettlement agency. And it might mean that they have to wait until some of our um, service navigators are available, um, or they they might have to uh, continue to communicate with us in, in our meetings. But uh, we are offering that longer term support and many of our co-sponsored families are actually enrolled in our preferred communities uh, case management program because they're families that are larger and have um, more language needs. So make sure that you're you're working with those partners, stay focused on those key aspects, and also understand that you, if a family is not interested uh, to move on, then they are going to move on with integration at their at their pace, right? So sometimes people say to me, oh, um, I'm, I'm motivated to help, but the challenge is my family is not interested in doing this. Well, at some point you have done what you can, you've informed, you've accompanied, but if now is not the right time for your family to take that step and get that driver's license, or um, uh, say manage their appointments on their own, one thing that you're gonna be able to do as a sponsor is help them realize what are gonna be the consequences of them not being able to do that on their own. And sometimes stepping back and asking them to turn to that second set of social support network might be the solution. So saying, all right, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna be here to manage your appointments. So when I'm not here, how are you gonna get that doctor's appointment? What, and you know, they might have their own solutions. They might say, well, I'm gonna ask my friend. All right, well, you should make sure that your friend agrees to that, right? And that might be the longer term solution for them. It might not be the solution you would imagine, but it is the solution that will help them as maybe a family struggling with English for the next decade to come. Yeah, great. Um, and I think that you were referencing kind of like how to keep the, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, like keep the the family um, motivated. And I um, a follow-up question was, um, and we are um, coming to the end of our time together, but a follow-up question was then like, how would you keep the, um, the volunteers and sponsors motivated but i guess you're kind of saying like stay focused right on like the most important things um and that to some extent like in that second phase the volunteers and sponsors can step back right so they don't necessarily have to like stay motivated through all of the second phase um or i don't know do you have other advice on right. like, motivation yeah no i would volunteers come back to that. And sponsors yeah well i would come back to that last family that i mentioned um a pre-literate family where Yes, the, where the co-sponsors are, are great, they want to still be working with our preferred communities case manager to help the families uh, manage, learn how to manage their appointments, manage their bills, you know, things that are very one-on-one. -on -one. But um, one of the things that's important for all of us to realize, including the family, is um, they need to maintain those good relationships with their work supervisor. They need to keep on going to ESL and um, appreciate their teacher. They need to keep on going to that sewing team um, because, again, those relationships are going to provide them the connection to friends, um, in, that, in their case, uh, references, the kind of people who are gonna be working with them long-term. It won't be the, 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 the co-sponsors necessarily, it's going to be those other people in the, in the community. And that's the greatest service that you can have. Make sure that you're building up your family's trust and relationship with those key partners. 
Yes, um, thank you so much. I know I've learned a lot from this conversation. Um, I trust that everyone that's joined us here today has learned as well. Uh, thank you so much, um, Thomas, and thank you everyone else for joining us. We'd like to hear from you and receive any feedback on today's Lunch and Learn. Um, we'll ask that you take a moment right now. I believe um, we are going to drop a link into the, uh, the chat here. Um, uh, on your control panel. Um, if you'd take a moment to uh, to complete that survey, we look forward to hearing from you and any suggestions you have on future Lunch and Learns. Um, and you will also receive today a follow-up email with a link to a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Refugee Welcome Collective, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>